So you want to ride faster or perhaps you want to ride the same speed but for a little bit less effort. Well in this video I'm going to give you some tips and guidance on how to do that for free or the very least with minimal outlay in terms of cost. And the best thing about all this stuff is it's actually way easier to do than you probably first realised. Right, let's get to this. Let's start with the easiest one and it is also free as well and that is to have your tyres set to the correct pressure relative to your weight, your bike setup and the surface that you're riding on. Having your tyres to higher pressure or to lower pressure is going to rob you of some of your speed and some of your effort when you're riding along. Now, I've spent 15 years racing my bike, and I think it's fair to say tyre pressures are one of the most overlooked characteristics when it comes to tuning the handling and the comfort and the speed of your bike. Now, this is relevant for both professional and amateur riders alike. Now, there have been loads and loads of independent tests, and they've proven that having your tyre pressure set too high will only give you the feeling of speed, and it isn't actually faster unless you're riding on a glass-like surface such as an indoor velodrome. However, have your tyre pressure set too low and too squidgy and you're still going to be robbed of speed and your effort and the tyre is going to roll underneath you, sort of affecting your handling as well. Now setting your tyre pressures correctly is actually a little bit of tricky business and it can seem quite confusing, but thankfully there are loads of really helpful resources and guides online, such as this one from Silco, and then it will give you some guidance onto the tyre pressures that you should use for the front and rear of your bike. Now remember, this is guidance, so you can tweak it ever so slightly to suit your preference and riding style. And if you want to take sort of getting your tyre pressures to the next level, to the next nerd level in fact, you can use something like this, which is a digital tyre pressure gauge, so you can really dial it in and turn the nerd levels up. Perfect. Next up is something Ollie and I quite literally bang on about all of the time, and you should know better because we've made quite literally a million videos about how to clean and correctly lubricate your bike. Scrub a dub dub. Now, this is a super easy way to speed up what, how fast you can ride, basically. Now, effectively, not only is a correctly cleaned and maintained bike gonna look boss, the parts are also gonna last longer as well. And some of the biggest gains to be made are when it comes to the chain of your bike. There are other components that are important as well, such as all of the bearings should spin freely as well. But what you're trying to achieve is to have clean, maintained surfaces everywhere that they should be clean, and places such as your chain and areas where it needs to be grease and lubrication needs to be clean and have the correct levels of lubrication. Now, as I said, your chain is where some of the biggest gains can be made. And if you compared a chain completely covered in crap to one which is cleaned and lubricated correctly, you could be looking in the region of 10 to 15 watt savings for most types of riders. And that is a pretty significant saving if you ask me. Now to save, that kind of wattage in other areas of your bike is going to cost you a significant amount of money. Now, independent tests have shown some of the fastest chain lubricants about to be waxed based. And while some of these could seem expensive in terms of the initial outlay, when you consider how long some of these lubricants are going to last in terms of overall use and between applications, and the fact it should make your chain and other components last longer, the sort of price per application actually becomes way more affordable. Oh, and um, it also means you're not going to get any of those messy black chain remarks on your leg looking like a bit of a novice. Easy win. Right, back to tyres super quickly here, because I want to talk about valve length. A small detail, you might say, and I am in complete agreement, but small details do make a small difference, and I think it's worth taking a look at. In terms of the valve length, there is nothing more annoying and wasting a bit of time and speed seeing people using valves longer than what they need to be. A valve needs to be long enough to poke through the wheel rim that you're using and only be long enough for the pump to be attached. Any longer, it's gonna have a very small aerodynamic penalty and also a very small amount of additional weight added onto your bike. Now, it's simple. Get this right at the point of buying your inner tubes or your tubeless valves and just stick to getting it right the first time around. Just the same as what you would with a set of clothes, for example. You wouldn't go and buy trousers that are too long, would you? <laughs> 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 So talking of clothing and buying the correct size, this is another really simple 
cheap and effective upgrade that you can make to your cycling. And there's two different ways to go about it. Now, if by chance you happen to be in the market for needing to purchase some new kit, then make sure the stuff you're buying is gonna be tight and snug fitting. It doesn't have to be restrictive, nor does it have to be expensive because a lot of the advantages to be had from buying aerodynamic clothing come from the fact that it's tight fitting and doesn't have excess material flapping around in the wind. The most basic bits to get right are the fit and shape of the jersey and the clothing that you're using. So maybe consider going down a size. Now, if you've already got the kit that you need and you don't want to head out and buy new stuff, but you are sat there thinking, oh, my stuff's a little bit loose and flaps about in the wind, well, you could always look to get it tailored. Now, hear me out here, because I know it might seem a little bit of a weird thing to do, but simply taking a jersey or jacket that you've got that is a bit too big, taking it to a tailor, and they can take it in at the seams and make it a far nicer, snugger fit, which is gonna, in turn, help speed you up. In fact, this is actually something that I did way, way back in my days of racing, when our new team kit hadn't all arrived in time, so I just took bib shorts and a jersey to a tailor, and this little old lady stitched it all together and made me an aero speed suit, all one piece thing, and it cost like 10 pounds, which is kind of pretty amazing if you think about that. So yeah, nice low cost upgrade. Okay, helmets are the next thing I wanna discuss here, and there are two ways to make improvements here. Now this is an aero helmet, and you can tell it's like that because of the shape of it and the fact that there are not many vents on the front of it, just two small ones, one on either side. Now, if you can't, afford or don't want to choose to spend the extra money on an aerodynamic helmet, easy way you can go about that is to modify your existing bike helmet. This is particularly going to be beneficial if you use a bike helmet with a very open and vented design. So by simply getting some electrical tape, you can carefully tape up the vents on your bike helmet to make it have a more streamlined and aerodynamic shape, much like a specific dedicated aero helmet. And if you ride in a hot climate, well, you can leave a couple of the vents open. Using some tape like this is only really gonna cost you in the region of a pound, a euro or a dollar. So it's super affordable. And it just is a case of taking time to get a neat finish on all of the sections of tape. If your helmet straps are a little bit too long and there's loads of excess material underneath, you can simply get some sharp scissors cut the spare bit off and then use a little lighter to um, melt the ends so they don't fray. Right then, final tip here, and this is shaving your legs. Something that I think many experienced cyclists will already be doing. But maybe if you're perhaps newer to the sport, you might be going, what the hell do people shave their legs for? Well, tests in wind tunnels have, conduct that have been conducted say that if you're cycling at 45 kilometers an hour, shaved legs versus hairy legs, you're looking in the region of around a 14 watt difference. Now I know that most people, myself included, don't exactly regularly cycle at 45 kilometers an hour, but even at slightly more conservative speeds, there's still a saving to be had. And like I said earlier about your chain, saving those sorts of watt figures on other areas of your bike could cost you a significant amount of money. So it's an easy, quick fix to get some free, simple speed. So. Those are more than enough tips and guidance to get you started and help speed up your rides. And I do genuinely think that if you did all of these things together, it would make enough difference that you would be able to feel a difference in speed of your cycling. So there you go. Hope you enjoyed this video. If you have, please give it a thumbs up. Comment in the comment section down below if you've got any speedy tips of your own. And um, well, if you want to support GCN Tech and the stuff that we do, subscribe and turn on your notifications. Right. I'm out of here. Gonna have to go uh, shave my legs, try and speed up. See you later.